Hello, everyone. This is the Vice President of Internet Infidels, Edward Tamijian, and I'm also on Internet Infidels Kiosk Editorial Review Committee, and I have a library piece on the origin of evil. And today, we are going to be interviewing, yet again, the legendary, the one and only, John Dominic Crossan, who used to be the co-chair of the Jesus Seminar, as you will all know, and um, he became a national religious bestseller back in the day. He has a couple of books on that list, and he's received awards and honors as well. And before we get into the questions, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, very good to be back with you, Ed. My background shows Caesar holding my new book. That's that's my wife's my wife's work with Photoshop. Hey, <laughs> I don't know good, it's good. It <laughs> we got it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good. All righty. So diving into our first question, tell okay. us about the Q source hypothesis and what your thoughts are on it. Okay. Let me back up a bit. Take this word source criticism. And I really want people to understand, don't think of this as some weird thing that we biblical scholars do, and it's an exoteric practice, and it's kind of some kind of witchcraft. Source criticism is actually the basis of life. <laughs> you're deciding on the cereal you're going to have for breakfast or what you're going to eat or how you're going to eat it. You're, you're doing source criticism. You're trying to find out what television, CNN or Fox, you're doing source criticism. You cannot get away from source criticism except stop thinking or living completely. Now, when you turn that down to the Bible, it's not like you suddenly invent something. Source criticism is what you have to do anytime you make a choice of reading this, trusting that, you can't get away from it. If you think you get away from it, you stop living. It's called a cemetery, okay? Lots of people are in cemeteries, that's all right, but they ain't doing source criticism. So don't think of it as weird, all right. Secondly, when we scholars do it, it's a sort of a um, due diligence, okay? Due diligence. So think of it as due diligence. I, I have to decide if I'm going to read stuff, how do I do it? Secondly, if I'm doing it as a scholar, if I'm a doctor or a lawyer, anyway, if I'm a plumber or anyone with a responsibility for doing stuff, mm -hmm. I have to do due diligence. What kind of pipes do I have to get? What do I do? I have to be able to do a fiduciary responsibility. All of that are ordinary words. Now. Pardon? Let's come back to source criticism. We have the Gospels. Anyone who can count knows there's four of them. Yep. Basically, there was only one Jesus. So we got four, vi four visions of Jesus. Now, yeah. for about 100 years, scholars who had nothing better to do <laughs> <laughs> looked at those four. And the way they did that, by the way, and if you're serious about doing it, you have to do it this way. You put them in, in part of that columns. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the way you do it. That's the only way, you read this way. Otherwise you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and as my students once told me, they're all saying the same thing. <laughs> so <laughs> I put, give a student that in parallel columns, and then you begin to see it. So after a hundred years, they realized something's going on. Yeah. I was a teacher, and if I got a couple of exam papers and I'm reading them, and uh, there's too much similarity in the order here, too much similarity in the, the stuff, and both of them spelled Moses, M-O-S-S-E-S, so I'm going to call those four into my office. I've done this with three, I've never done it with four, and said, please explain to me this similarity, it's too much. And in that case, thank God I was careful, they said, well, we live together, we do our work together, we share a dorm room. Okay, just be careful you're not copying from in there. They weren't, so. So, as a source critic, <laughs> you figure, okay, now, there's some kind of relationship going on between this Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If this was a court of law, we'd be talking plagiarism. Mm -hmm, yeah. The consensus, and it is a consensus, it's not an act of faith, it really isn't, that Mark is the major source used by Matthew and Luke. Perfect. That's a consensus. Now, whether John is completely separate or using Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I leave that aside, but that Mark is the major source for Matthew and Luke. Yes. That's a decision. It's a source critical decision. It could be upended tomorrow if somebody digs up a manuscript and we find, <laughs> wow, there's a manuscript called uh, the X-Files. <laughs> and we have a little, little bit of Mark, a little bit of Matthew. Little bit, wow, all three of them are copying from a lost one. Possible. Okay. In the meanwhile, that's the consensus. So Mark is, but as soon as that became the consensus, then you could look at these in three 
columns and you could see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and you could see that was fine. Let's call that the triple attestation. But then you kept seeing there was other stuff in there where Matthew and Luke had the same stuff and it ain't in Mark. Now, the first time you see that, okay, just coincidence. After a while, you notice there is a similarity in order, order, sequence, yeah. and content. So it's a double argument. And then eventually, you notice, for example, it's when John the Baptist is going after the Pharisees and calling them all sorts of names. There's almost 60 words in Mark, sorry, in Matthew and Luke, not in Mark. That's too much for oral tradition. Okay. If you tell me the story of the Good Samaritan and I tell it, even though both of us know the written text, we're probably going to do it differently. Mm -hmm. So the consensus was there are two sources. One is called the Gospel card to Mark. We got that. Thank God. Otherwise, we'd still be arguing about some unknown source. Mm -hmm. Then we have presuming Mark. If we're wrong about Mark, by the way, we're wrong about Q. There's another gospel, and the first scholars who came up with that were thinking in German, working in German, in Germany, and their word in German for a source is Quelle, Q-U-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, and it's capitalized, and nouns are capitalized. So they call it the Quelle, the source. Now, that's kind of not a nice way to put it. It's more than a source. We don't call Mark the source. Mm -hmm. So I call it the gospel according to Q, just to keep Q in there so People know what I'm talking about. Like some guy named Q. <laughs> yeah, as it were. We have the gospel according to Mark. We don't know who Mark is. So we have the gospel according to Q. And we can work out a certain amount because we are talking about a written gospel. That's the thesis. And it's not just a hypothesis that somebody made up. It's like if you're walking on the, the beach and you see a, a footprint, the necessary hypothesis is there's probably a person. Now, it could be a seagull with boots on. But on the presumption it's not a seagull <laughs> with, who's learned to wear boots, it's probably a person. Okay, a necessary hypothesis, but that's all it is. Now, that's a consensus. That doesn't mean that I don't know eminent scholars who disagree with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But let me tell you a bit where I am on this. Okay. In the 60s, I was really working on the historical Jesus. That's what I was preparing my work on. That was going to be my, my life's work. I didn't know that at the time. And I was doing all of this stuff, getting my sources organized just to do, 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 do diligence. I wasn't primarily interested in it. You could spend your whole life working on the synoptic problem. You could, absolutely okay. Yeah. I just wanted to get over it so I could get some kind of a secure idea. Now, I wasn't just going to go with the consensus. So in the 60s, lots of people had very different lives in the 60s. I was living in a monastery. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lots of time to study. So what I did was I got out my parallel columns and I used to put, put a paper over Matthew and, and Luke, read Mark and see if I could guess cumulatively what each would do with it. Oh, that's a good. And it was really interesting because after a while I got, I'm inside Matthew. I know what makes him tick. He's not going to like that. He probably would adapt it. Luke's not going to like that. He just skip it. <laughs> so after a while, you, you felt really, and there was a there was a feedback loop because if I was reading Mark and Matthew and Luke really didn't like something, then that gave me a clue that Mark, this is probably Mark and rather than traditional. If they really leave it out, if Matthew leaves it out and Luke leaves it out. I'm watching two minds deciding, eh, we don't like this. So I was able to figure I'm closer to Mark by that feedback loop. Now, I was doing that in the 60s. By the end of the 60s, I say in 1973, my first book in Jesus came out uh, in parables, the challenge of the historical Jesus. That was the subtitle. Yeah. So I wanted to get that done. I honestly did. I, I thought of it, if I <laughs> excuse the expression, exegetical foreplay. <laughs> I didn't want to spend my life doing it. I wanted to get on with the job in hand. It was if I was a lawyer, you know, I'm working on my sources to go into court. I'm, look, I'm getting my witnesses organized, 
yeah, this guy copied from that guy. I can't copy, can't trust him because he's he's just saying what he heard from him. Now I'm ready to go into court. And mm -hmm. I hope I'm right that witness A was copied by witness B and C. Otherwise, I'm going to lose. So that's where I was with sources. So the Q hypothesis, our theory, if you want to put it that, is now it's interesting because when you get to look at it, it's not just a drawer to stick stuff in. It's really basically a collection of sayings in which Jesus is, it's not really a good story. I mean, if you were doing a, a film of Jesus, you could really work with Mark. Yeah. Eh, you're not going to work with Q. That's a talking head. <laughs> now, talking heads like me now are terribly interesting, of course. <laughs> I'm not going to knock talking heads when I'm doing it. <laughs> but, you know, Jesus has a talking head. Yes, serious. If you want to know, for example, if he says, blessed are the poor and you're going to live like that, mm -hmm. that's serious. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But it's not a narrative gospel. It's not a biographical gospel like okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Are. It's a sayings gospel. Okay. A collection of the sayings of Jesus. If there was a title on it, it would might be the sayings of, of Jesus. Yeah. Or the sayings of the wise one. Yeah. And the model for it is that Jesus, now it's a serious theology, by the way. It ain't just the guy talking. This is wisdom has come down to earth and is speaking through Jesus. And what does wisdom expect to be done? Refused and goes back to God. So there is a theology, of course. <laughs> There's a powerful theology and a very different theology. But that's the sayings, gospel, Q, or the gospel according to Q. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. And just commenting, um, your next <clears throat> book title should be Exegetical Foreplay. I think that'll be a national bestseller just on the title. <laughs> I know, but you know, to be, be honest, that's unique right there. <laughs> to be honest with you, I have to tell people that because I, I could have spent my whole life in it. Now, what I did do in the 60s, seriously, mm -hmm. I took the hypothesis, the two source hypothesis, I went through every single line of the gospel to see if it worked. Now, what I didn't do was try all the alternatives. I didn't. I mean, I oh. could do the same amount for take yeah, four years. Yeah, that takes a lot of work. But I really tried this one. So I didn't just take the consensus. I ended up by saying, yeah, I spent about four years on it. And yep, it's as good as you get. I'm not going to try all the alternatives. Yeah. So I'm off on my work on the historical Jesus. Awesome. Sounds good. All righty. Going to our second question. Though the Gospel of Thomas manuscripts are late, you believe that it reflects pretty early oral traditions about Jesus's words and sayings. Would you care to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, you know, when, I, when I was finishing my doctoral work and we had to do another uh, Semitic language, we, had, we learned Hebrew and, and Aramaic course. Nobody told me I should take Coptic. I wish <laughs> they had. <laughs> they told me Syriac. That was the word. Syriac was in. Learn Syriac. So I learned Syriac, I passed an exam to prove I know Syriac. I have never used it in 50 years. And after one or two years, I probably didn't even remember the alphabet. I wish I'd learned Coptic, but I did at least see the gospel of Thomas. I was in, Sarah and I were in Old Cairo in 1999 in the, the museum, the Coptic museum and got in to see Thomas. So at least I've seen it, but anyway, here's what interests me now. It okay. is a second century document. I mean, a tangible, it's not like you, it's a document you can hold in your hands if you have gloves on and everything else, which would be the proper way to do it. You can hold it. It is there. And it is entitled the Gospel of Thomas. At the end of it, that's the title that's on it. So it is a gospel. Now, as soon as you read it, immediately you think of Q because it's the sayings of Jesus again. Yeah. And again, it has its own theology. It's not just, you know, undiluted. It has its own profound theology. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. If you understand these sayings of Jesus, the world opens up for you. Now, there are some contacts because you can't give a list of sayings without sort of remembering this one and that one. If I ask you to write out 25 sayings of Jesus, you might come up with, say, the Good Samaritan. And that might remind you of this, the um, miracle of the Samaritans. There's linkages, of course, but yeah. basically... There are two lists of the sayings of Jesus, Q and Thomas. Now, here's what interested me. 
let me go to share screen for a second. Okay. Uh, I can do it. You can do it. Right. Right. I'm pull up and just let me know. Yeah. Could you make me my ho host, please, too? Then I'll go to share screen. I should have reminded you. Participants. This should do it. Yeah, that should do it. Is right. Yes, there it is. Take a look at that spider's web. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll explain it. There are about 30 sayings. Look at the look at down the first row. There's about 30 sayings that are in Q and are also in Thomas. All right. Mm -hmm. 30. You know, in rough numbers, about a third of the sayings in Q and a third of the sayings in Thomas come out with the same saying. All right. There's 30 common sayings. All right. Mm -hmm. And anyone can see this. Just get your list. This is an article written by Bruno de Solange, a professor and a philosopher, a priest, a Jesuit priest. I think, yeah, was he a Jesuit? I'm not certain of a Jesuit. He was a priest uh, in Toulouse in France. And what he did was he took the sayings, in the, the Q sayings, in the order of Luke. You can see the column. It's in French, by the way, so it's L U C. Okay, yeah. yeah. Luke. So he has written in French. Uh, he, he was French, that's why. So you have the order of the saying, the Q sayings in Luke, you see the column. And then over on the other side, you have the, the order of the sayings in Matthew, because they're Matthew and Luke rearrange the sayings. Then he puts in the middle, the order of Thomas. And you see an okay. absolute spider's web that drives you crazy. No one else has done this. I've kept this copy. I read it, it came out in oh, 79. I kept the copy, it's a, the bulletin of, uh, Ecclesiastical literature, it's a French uh, journal. I've kept this because I've never seen anything like it. And it, you know, you see, what you're trying to imagine is if Thomas, for example, knew Matthew, just say he knew Matthew, or he knew Luke, or he even had a copy of Q, and he's just assembling a collection of the sayings of Jesus, mm -hmm. why would he bother changing the order like that? I mean, here or there, there might be one that connects to the other with a common word like the kingdom of God. But if I give you a list, <laughs> if I give you a grocery list, <laughs> you know, if, if my wife gives me a grocery list to go to the to pick up stuff, I probably won't redo the whole thing. And if I do redo the whole thing, it's probably because I'm neurotic and I'm going to do it according to the the order of the grocery store. So I come in here and go right down the aisles and, you know, that's sort of neuroticism. But basically, why would you change a list? So if you have the list in, uh, in Q or Matthew or Luke, now they have their own intentions of how they're doing it because they have to fit it into Mark, of course. Why would you, if you're Thomas, you're copying it? So I think the only way I can understand this is that Thomas has a list of 30 sayings of Jesus. The gospel according to Q has a list of 30 sayings of Jesus. Neither of them got it from a written document because otherwise the order is going to hit the same every now and then. It's mm -hmm. almost back to. You know, if, if you're reading, for example, the, the Beatitudes either in Luke or in Matthew and you're copying them out, why would you start, say, with the third one to go to the first one and find the first Second one, you, you're kind of trapped to do them in the order you're looking at, unless you have a reason. Mm -hmm. And Thomas, as far as I can see, has no reason to put this there and that there. So I am convinced, this is my argument, it is not original. Another oh. author, Steve Patterson, has made it, and I think it's a brilliant argument. That's why I have it copied and, and credited to him in The Birth of Christianity. Sweet. Which is a big book, you know, that thick. But if you're serious, you might want to think of that. That goes back to what, 1998, I guess, almost 25 years ago. And the argument is that there must have been oral tradition, mm -hmm. oral tradition of the sayings of Jesus out there. And I will never argue for oral tradition unless I have two written documents and I cannot explain them as copying from anything else. Okay. And that's because of the order. You understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would anyone looking at Mark say, let me imagine I'm Thomas. I look at Luke and, say, and I say, well, there's, there's about 30 sayings in there I really like. The rest of that stuff I don't like, not my theology, but I like some of this stuff. Now, 
why would I choose one here, one there, one there, one there, and create this spider web? I, I couldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Unless he's been completely perverse and trying to make certain he's not going to be sued for plagiarism. <laughs> like you know, if somebody copied, but you wouldn't get away with it. If, if you copy the list from somebody else and just rearrange the list, they could show up. <laughs> Yeah, it's like nice to... tries. <laughs> yeah, nice try, nice try. But the court of law, with a good lawyer, you're going to lose. So my argument is that there is what I call the common sayings tradition. Okay. Which is not written down. It's like you or I, and if we both decided at the end of this, you're going to write down 30 sayings of Jesus. I'm going to write down 30 sayings of Jesus. If we found out we had exactly the same order, then you and I better see a psychiatrist or something. <laughs> you, you wouldn't do it. You, you, you probably would come up with a lot of the same stuff. Yeah. I suppose you hit the parables, they're easier to remember, so I hit the parables. But we wouldn't get the same order. Now, maybe you'd copy out a mark and get the order of mark, and I might copy out a mark, get the order of mark. But that would be mark. Yeah. That wouldn't be out of Dominic. So there's the argument. We mm -hmm. have access to a common sayings tradition earlier than either Q or Thomas. And since Q is dated to mm, the 50s or the 60s, I think this is the oral tradition that was somewhere around in the 40s. Ooh, okay. and I think in terms of objective evidence, now the objective evidence presumes you're accepting the existence of Q, of course. Yeah, yeah. Presumes you're accepting that Thomas isn't copied from Matthew, Mark, or Q because of that evidence there. Mm -hmm. I would say we have a collection of the common sayings tradition from as close to the time of Jesus as we can get, as close as Paul, who's operating in the 30s, but not writing to, to the 50s. Mm -hmm. So that's my argument. Gotcha. Awesome. Very interesting. All righty. Well, thank you for that answer. I'll get back. Let me get rid of that now so we can get out of the spider's web. There we go. Awesome. Oh, okay. we're, Very we're good. Around. Yeah. Glad that new. I, I think that you have to almost look at that you know, if you want to convince yourself, mm -hmm. the, the spider's web. If I said that without showing it, it sounds like, you know, yeah, prejudice. Yep, yeah, yeah, awesome. All righty, well, yeah, that was interesting. Thank you for that. All righty, and then uh, for our last question of the day, um, tell, uh, tell our audience uh, one statement by Jesus that uh, was recorded by him that you believe that is what he actually said and that leaves the deepest impression on you. I'm sure when you were the co-chair of the Jesus Seminar, you had to think about this a lot. So tell, tell us your thoughts. An authentic saying of Jesus that leaves the greatest impression on you. Okay. By the way, thank you for that question. That's a lovely question. I know. Most, most people say, give us a list. And by the time you get a list, let me focus on one and I'll tell you why. All right. Let me go to another uh, scholar whom I respect. This is Father John Meyer of Notre Dame University. And he is writing, as you probably know, it looks like a seven volume work on the historical Jesus. Each of them is about as thick as that. Mm -hmm. He's got five of them out. I've read every single word of every single one of them, by the way, and I have them annotated to all over the place like a blitzkrieg. In the last one, volume five, he's talking about the parables and he argues that there are only four that go back to Jesus. Now, I wasn't interested in arguing that against him because that just gets us off the track. I wanted to focus, this is in an article I wrote about it, on the fact that the mustard seed, the parable of the mustard seed is the only one that is found in two independent sources, back to sources, in the New Testament. It's found both in Q and in Mark. Now, I would add a third outside because I think it's also, well, it's also in Thomas and I think Thomas is independent, but John does not think Thomas is independent. He thinks it's copying from Mark. So I leave that aside. Now, let me look at that then. Mm -hmm. I said, basically in, in the article I wrote, I will take and rest my historical Jesus on the parable of the mustard seed if all else is gone. Mm -hmm. I will note it's the only parable in two independent sources within the New Testament, mm -hmm. Q and uh, Mark. Now think about it for a second. Both of them, both of them, by the way, 
say that the kingdom of God, God's rule on earth, is like a mustard seed. No. Now, you know, somebody would have said to Jesus, you're nuts. <laughs> You've been hitting the Galilean wine too much. <laughs> a mustard seed, at least. What about a cedar of Lebanon? A mighty cedar of Lebanon. So it's like a mustard seed. And secondly, it's worse than that because he said it's a domestic mustard seed, which a, which a person throws on the ground. Now, mustard comes in two types, domestic and wild. Okay, wild mustard seed, you could say God's running the show. But domestic mustard seed means I have to cooperate. I planted it. So wait a minute. I mean, imagine Jesus now has just told this story. Imagine the audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's get past anyone saying, we think you're kind of crazy. <laughs> or somebody being elegant to say, this sounds to me like a paradigm shift. <laughs> I mean, the kingdom of God is supposed to change the whole world. When God's rule arise, Caesars ain't around anymore. Yeah. We have God's rule. I'm listening to Jesus now and I'm saying, Jesus, please, you know, please, I have great respect for you. But nothing has changed. You're saying the kingdom of God, God's rule is already here. It's a little bit hidden. It's a bit like a mustard seed you can hardly see and it's going to grow. <laughs> Where is that in the tradition, Jesus? Whoever said that when God's rule came, it wouldn't be like a lightning strike and the whole world would be changed in an instant. Yeah. Whoever said it would be a process, mm. you know, and a process of just an ordinary domestic mustard seed. I mean, that must have struck them as absolutely absurd, almost like a cruel joke. Tiberius was still, uh, yeah, Tiberius was still over there. Antipas still running Galilee. Pilate, the whole gang is still in there, all the usual suspects. And you're saying that God's rule has arrived, though it's a little small and has to grow? I think you're crazy, Jesus. Now, how, you'd ask Jesus, how can that be? We always thought it would be a, you know, I live in Florida, hurricanes, we know, approach, and then they strike. But when you announce landfall, you mean landfall. And yeah, if you say it hit, it hit land and it was at um, Myrtle Beach, <laughs> then I presume if I look up Myrtle Beach on my computer, I'm going to see some wind. Yeah, so oh, yeah. you announce a hurricane has arrived if there's no wind? Yeah, I got you. Arrive? How could you even say the king? It's a, it's a nasty, cruel joke for people who are depending on it. Mm -hmm. Unless, unless, unless there's something else. And here's what I think is the distinctive message of Jesus. As distinct from John the Baptist. And that's why this parable is important. Because Jesus is saying to them, you have been waiting for God to do it for you. You're waiting for the big bang crash. And God's going to do it, and Caesar will be gone, and all will be peaceful. And you'll hear the anvil chorus of everyone beating their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hook, and everyone peaceful, and everything will be lovely, and God's going to do it for you. And Jesus might have said, Do you notice that Isaiah and Micah said they will beat their swords into plowshare? Nothing about God doing it for you. Ooh. So maybe we've been wrong in waiting for God to do it for us, Jesus. You mean God has been waiting for us to do it with God? Yeah. I think that's what makes the message of Jesus differ from John the Baptist and is a paradigm shift, okay, a yeah. tradition swerve, a disruptive innovation, as we say today, in Jewish eschatological expectation. But it's the only thing that makes any sense of using the mustard seed as an image of the kingdom of God. So for me, I will go, and I've said this in public and in, in, in debating with, with John Meyer, if that's my only parable, if that's the only saying of Jesus, I can get what I want from that. Because you can't announce the presence of the rule of God when everyone can look around and see it ain't here unless you've changed the meaning of how we expect the rule of God. Something has changed. Now, you could say it's something else. It means it's... It means it's coming tomorrow morning. Well, that would work for 24 hours. 
eventually people would have said to Jesus, you talk about the kingdom of God, God's rule on earth, leaving out the patriarchal language of kingdom, God's rule on earth. We've been waiting for it for 500 years. Now you've said it's here. Mm -hmm. You are either practicing a cruel joke on us because we've been waiting for it, or you understand it different from the way we've expected it as a divine intervention. Yeah, yeah. So that would be my one. Awesome. All righty. Thank you very much for that answer, good sir. All righty. And just in time. Awesome. All righty. Well, thank you again for a very wonderful interview. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, everyone, should you should check out Dr. John Dominic Crossan's Render into Caesar. It, it looks really interesting. And I've heard a lot of his lectures on YouTube, and they're really good. You should check out his lectures, too. All righty, sir. Well, in a couple of minutes, I'll send you a link to this, and you can share it and do what you like with it. Thank you very much, Ed. I'll put it up on my own Facebook. And thank you, Ed. Always a pleasure. Yes, Bye. very good. Thank you.